in the wise words of Adele, hello. My name is Prince Gumin, and I'm here to reveal the unknown person you will all marry for the rest of your life. Talking about marketing. To show you just how deep this relationship goes, I will connect the dots between data, AI, and neuromarketing, which is the application of neuroscience to marketing. And I want to start by telling you a true story about a father, not just any father, an angry father. This father showed up at his local Target store demanding to speak to the store manager. He was upset about the inappropriate coupons Target was sending his teen daughter. They all fit a very particular theme. Baby diapers, bottles, baby clothes. I can see why he was upset. His next conversation with the manager, though, was deeply apologetic. Turns out, Target knew what the father did not. His daughter was pregnant. How did Target know? No, the store manager was not the baby's daddy. <laughs> Target knew because of artificial intelligence. And there are three things that are really crazy about this case. One, the daughter had not browsed any pregnancy-related items at all. Two, Target predicted the pregnancy primarily using two sources of data offline, credit cards and the Target discount card. Three, this took place 10 years ago. Just to put that in perspective for you, the most popular TV show at that time was Jersey Shore. That's when Snooki entered our vocabulary and we're all worse for it. <laughs> Target story is the past. Let's talk about the present. Today, brands cannot just predict future behavior, but they can also model it by combining AI with neuroscience. One of the ways to do this is by using ocean analysis. <clears throat> when it comes to psychology-based personality theories, ocean analysis is number one, max is number two. The acronym OCEAN represents five different key core personality traits. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Your OCEAN profile is your score on each of these traits. Ocean analysis can predict a range of outcomes from relationship success, which is high agreeableness, to racism, which is low openness. Today, it is the most valid form of personality analysis available and is freakishly accurate at predicting and modeling your future behavior. Here's a free hashtag life hack. Instead of reading your horoscopes, go take an ocean test. You'll learn a lot more about yourself. Imagine a world where people walked around with their ocean scourge on their forehead. How persuasive would marketing be then? That's exactly what happened. It took place in the political arena. I'm talking about Brexit and the US presidential election of Donald Trump. So, Cambridge created simple Facebook surveys that 270,000 people took. Surveys were a bit like this. Which Beatles band member are you? Or which Harry Potter house you belong to? I took that one, shout out to Hufflepuffs. The actual, the actual questions of the surveys were trivial because taking the survey provided Cambridge access to all of your Facebook data. So all the participants' Facebook data was in the hands of Cambridge, but also their friends as well. At the end of the day, Cambridge walked away with data from 87 million people. And technically, this is what's scary, they did so without breaking the law. Next, they used this data to create unique ocean profiles for each person. Then they use this profile to create hyper-personal ads. For example, people who are rated high on neuroticism and conscientiousness and are therefore paranoid were shown a pro-Trump ad that showed an armed break-in by a burglar. The ad read, and this is verbatim, the Second Amendment isn't just a right, it's an insurance policy. Defend the right to bear arms. Vote for Donald Trump. So combining ocean analysis with AI, it helped create highly persuasive messages, which can be perfectly, and I mean perfectly tailored to your personality. Welcome to the world of Psych AI, our new reality. The target case was the past. Cambridge is the present. What about the future? Meet Shudu and Coffee Graham. What do Shudu and Coffee have in common? One, they're supermodels. Two, I have a shot with neither of them because three, they're fake. They are deep fakes. 
digitally generated supermodels who have convinced consumers of their actual existence. And they have contracts from the likes of Gucci, Fendi, and Tom Ford. If the technology to create convincing deepfakes of supermodels exists, what's to stop someone from creating a deepfake of me? Let's be honest, that's like asking a Ferrari engineer to make a Hyundai. Yes, they can do it. Yes, they will do it because of something called the cocktail party effect. Imagine the scenario. We had a crowded party, having a couple of drinks, catching up with a close friend. You're sucked into your conversation, completely oblivious to the chatter of voices all around you. Then, all of a sudden, you hear it. Your name. Your name. 10 seconds ago, you had no idea the person who said it even existed, but now your attention is completely focused in that direction. That's the cocktail party effect. This is something that psychologists have known about since the 1950s. It even works when you're asleep. A part of your brain stays awake listening and paying attention for your name. Recent research has revealed that we have a special kind of attention, not just for our names, but for our faces as well. In other words, there is a thing called the visual cocktail party effect. It's not a matter of if our faces will be used by the brands, but when and how. And here are two very easy ways. One, social media. Imagine scrolling mindlessly through your newsfeed, and maybe you're the one person who claims to never click any of the ads you see, but how could you not when the person modeling those fancy new sunnies is you? You don't even have to consciously see that it's your face. The face doesn't even have to look exactly like you, just close enough to draw your attention. Mission accomplished for the ad. Second, face swap. Face swap videos. Imagine placing your face on another person's body in a digital video. There's a piece of tech called Zao that allows you to insert yourself as a character in a famous movie. The ad that introduced the app showed scenes from Inception with a completely different human being playing the role of Leonardo DiCaprio. Crazy, right? I don't know about you, but I'm kind of excited about this. On paper, this tech sounds pretty, pretty great. I can finally live up my dream of not just singing like Adele, but being Adele. <laughs> Hello, it's me. Now imagine face swaps technology being used to advertise something serious, like insurance. What would hit you harder than seeing a video of paramedics pulling your dead body out of a car crash? Call AIG now for your insurance quotes. The exact form of this new way of personalized face ads remains to be seen. One thing is for sure. The tech behind face-based ads is already being worked on. The culture of hyper-personalization already exists. Along with it, going to be massive opportunities for brands, fresh headaches for regulators, which, by the way, their understanding of AI goes as far as spelling it, especially in the States, and new puzzles for philosophers. Where do we go from here? Before I answer that, I want to take a minute to tell you why I'm here. Only a lunatic would ever sign a prenuptial agreement written in a foreign language. That is exactly what I did when I agreed to the terms and conditions of a little app called FaceApp. You may remember it. The app went viral by letting people upload photos of themselves and their friends and seeing what you might look like 40 years older or as an infant or as the opposite gender. All good fun, but it raised a lot of eyebrows regarding data safety and privacy. Forbes estimates that FaceApp now owns the digital faces of over 150 million people. I'm one of them. You are too. It may not be FaceApp. It may be the app you use to track your period, to track your nutrition, your calories, your workouts. You signed this prenup too. As a marketer, I felt gross and guilty as a consumer, I felt used. And it's a weird cognitive dissonance because I play both sides of the field. As a marketer, all I want to do is create amazing experiences and just epic, epic products for you all to fall in love with without creeping out. As a consumer, I want to be oohed and odd. I want to be charmed and flirted with by brands. I want to fall in love with products. Just don't creep me out, man. That's why I'm here. I'm here to bridge that gap between marketing and consumers. And in order to achieve that, to have a healthy relationship with consumerism, here are my three takeaways. These apply both to consumers and marketers. 
One, money is an outdated form of payment in the digital world. You still think transactions happen only when you pay. That mindset is outdated. Think about it, what is money? Money is a transfer of value. In the digital world, money does not need to change hands for someone to extract value from you. Every time you use discount cards, take a quiz, share a photo, a new type of value is being extracted from you. You're paying with the new international currency, your data. Two, break the addiction of free. Break the addiction of free. It's too easy to point a finger on Facebook and say you're abusing data, but you gotta look at the three pointing back at you. You, you spend more money on avocado toast than do on your own privacy every year. Companies like Facebook are not nonprofits. To run a digital country of two and a half billion people, it's not free. Since you're not willing to pay for those apps, that entire platform, companies are going to find other ways to extract value from you. And they have, by monetizing your data. Look, we had a good run. We got really drunk off of free content and we got super high on social media, okay? It's time to wake up from this bender. As the old saying goes, there's no free lunch. In the digital world, there's no free app. Three, demand fair trade apps. If you're willing to pay for ad-free apps, why not tracking free apps? That's what I mean by fair trade apps. It's ironic that we know more about where the coffee at Starbucks comes from and less about where our data goes when you connect to the Wi-Fi. It's easy to forget that not too long ago, organic food was not a thing. It was not until consumers, you, started to demand it and were willing to pay for it that it became a thing. Paid private alternate versions of apps are not an option right now because you're not demanding them and you're certainly not ready to pay for them. Time to change that. My name is Prince Gooman and I'm a neuromarketer. More importantly, I am a believer. I'm a believer in consumer power, in your power. If you decide to demand it and pay for it, they will build it. If you want a healthier relationship with marketing, you have two options. Option A, like Adele, you can sit there and cry about it. <laughs> Option B, like Beyonce, you can do something about it. When it comes to your inescapable marriage with marketing, be like Beyonce. That is an idea worth spreading. Thank you.